I'm going to tell you something about the quite surprising and amazing results of a seven-year follow-up that we did in a discontinuation strategy trial that we did in the beginning of the, of the century, in 2002. But first, uh, I would like to, to state, before proceeding, that I'm, um, like Larry Davidson also stressed, I'm not against the use of antipsychotics. I think you should use antipsychotics when you need them to treat positive symptoms. But as long as that takes, because when the symptoms are gone, you should try and reduce the doses as soon as possible and even possibly get rid of these drugs when symptoms allow for it. And uh, you should know that I'm talking about first episode psychosis patients like Marty Harrow also stressed that people who take antipsychotics for a long time, you are not very able to reduce dosages. So I'm talking about first episode patients, but I'll explain it further in the rest of my talk. So my disclosure is here, and it's uh, li maybe a little bit uh, particular that uh, pharmaceutical companies sponsored our trial, the first discontinuation trial was sponsored by Dutch government, but also by a pharmaceutical company named Eli Lilly. And the follow-up that we did after seven years was sponsored by the uh, pharmaceutical firm Janssen Silac. So <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if they're happy with the results, but <laughs> they have to do with it. The study that I'm going to talk to you about has been published in JAMA Psychiatry almost two years ago, but now it's really uh, a little bit becoming of a little bit of a hype uh, because it's very spectacular results I will show you. And it has been accompanied by an editorial wrote by uh, Pat McGorry and his group from Melbourne who, uh, who quote a guy named Yogi Berra. I didn't know, I didn't know him so I googled him. It's a US citizen. He is a, a baseball catcher, actually, and um, <clears throat> he, um, he is famous for his peculiar statements. And uh, he says here, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> okay. And that's a very good uh, statement in the context of what I'm going to talk to you about. As you might know, there has been lots of papers recently discussing the possibly draw, draw, the drawbacks of antipsychotic treatment. And as you know, of course, in normal development of the brain, the cerebral cortex shrinks. And that has to do with the, the pruning of the, oh, the, the, the overconnectivity in the brain, pruning of synapses. But it's also known that in schizophrenia, these processes are accelerated. But the difficulty is that you never know whether this is caused by the disease or by the medication that is used to treat the disease, namely antipsychotic drugs. So it's very difficult to disentangle the influence of the antipsychotic drugs reducing the synapses in the brain, or will, would it be maybe the disease itself that is responsible for this development? And Actually, we really don't know exactly what happens. It seems to be caused by both, both the disease and both antipsychotic drugs severely reduce the connectivity in the brain. The first uh, signs of that were demonstrated in animals, in macaque monkeys, that is the larger article up there by uh, Dorf Peterson from uh, Pittsburgh, from David Lewis's lab, and they give antipsychotic drugs to these apes, and they had a huge shrinkage of their brains. So that lead to all, all kinds of other um, research into the effects and the drawbacks of antipsychotics. And one important article was written by the group of Nancy and Dresden, and she eloquently put uh, this together where the arrow is over there, and she states that relapse prevention is important, but it should be sustained using the lowest possible medication doses that will control symptoms. So on the one hand, you want to control the symptoms, but on the other hand, you, want, you don't want to give too much 
of these antipsychotic drugs because they do harm. And that's a dilemma. And now I'm going to tell you something about dopamine, which probably you know a lot about, but you first have to remember that what all antipsychotic drugs have in common is that they block the dopamine D2 receptors. And <clears throat> when, uh, when they do that, uh, the dopamine effects are not there anymore. And dopamine, actually, is a very important substance in the brain because dopamine drives human emotion, it drives motivation, it makes you pursue your goals. So it's a very important substance acting in the brain as putting the brain alert to go after uh, its aims. And when you have no dopamine uh, working in the brain, of course you can imagine that you will see negative symptom-like behavior. Patients feeling like a zombie, not really having their true emotions, not feeling like going to do something that, that they usually would like to do. But there's another thing that you should know, and that is that the positive symptoms in psychosis do arise from burst activity in the dopaminergic tracts, from the midbrain, ventral tegmental area, where the dopamine neurons are re residing. There is burst activity to the ventral striatum area, the reward center, and there the dopamine activity will uh, activate the center to, to go after goals, to, to be prepared to, to grab something that you need, uh, so reward behavior. But when this activity is too much, you will develop psychotic signs like hallucinations or psychotic experiences. So what we do by blocking the dopamine system is, is not only treat the psychotic symptoms that are arising from dopamine overactivity in the ventral striatum, but it's also blocking this natural reward responses that you need to properly function in daily life. So actually, what you do is always good for the positive symptoms, but bad for how you are functioning as a human being. That is the background thought. So we also know that low uh, dopamine activity from the ventral tegmental area to the frontal cortex is also associated with negative symptoms. So by blocking dopamine, you even aggravate these symptoms if they are already present. And you have to uh, remind another thing, that is that dopaminergic derangement is not the primary thing that's go that goes wrong. There are probably a great number of pathways leading to dopaminergic derangements. And these pathways may be related with stress. Psychosis and schizophrenia are a stress-related disorder, that's for sure. They may be related to childhood adversity, childhood trauma, prolonged trauma, for instance. And this may all go along the tracks of glutamate dysfunction. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, which is probably even more important than dopamine, has another function. And glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter, but it also drives the GABA interneurons, which are inhibitory. So when you have a glutamate dysfunction, you might well be able to see that there might, that the result might be desinhibition, and that the ventral tegmental area, where the dopamine neurons are, that are too active in psychosis, are desinhibited, so they give a far more uh, exaggerated response to natural stimuli on this ventral tegmental area domain. So this may cause psychotic symptoms in people who have a deficient glutamate GABA inhibitory system on their ventral tegmental area dopamine system. So it's rather complicated. I hope you can follow me still. But what, what is the importance of these derangement higher upstream? 
related to other mechanisms, is that by using dopamine blockers, by using antipsychotics, this will never touch the baseline disturbance that you have. You're just doing symptomatic treatment, not touching the underlying disease. So dopaminergic blockade might be considered a peripheral therapy tar targeting a consequence of a derangement higher upstream. And then Marty also mentioned that, is that when you have used uh, antipsychotics for a long time and you block the dopamine system, of course the cells that receive the dopamine signals, they don't get any dopamine no longer. So they are going to point their ears and put receptors extra in their cellular membranes, which is called upregulation. And that makes the system hypersensitive to dopamine. So when you will then lower the dosage of the dopaminergic blockade, this hypersensitive system will immediately react with, again, psychotic symptoms and causing dopaminergic uh, problems. So it's very difficult when you use antipsychotics for a long time to get off them. Actually, you are hooked to them when you take them for a long time. So that's why you can imagine now, I think, that we wanted to treat first episode patients who are good, remitted from symptoms, that we want to try and discontinue the meds, and that we want to take first episode patients because they were easier to get off drugs and see what happened. So the original discontinuation trial, the key question was, is maintenance treatment according to the guidelines that we all use, that we should use actually in clinical practice, should we? Is maintenance treatment after remission of a first episode the best option? And of course, in clinical practice also, you're confronted with patients that do not accept long-term treatment. They come to you after one or two months having no symptoms and they say to you, well, uh, can't you get me off these drugs because I don't like to take drugs or I have some side effects. But even with, a, with no side effects, most patients don't want to take drugs. And as a matter of fact, the present guidelines do not account for any differences in the early course of psychotic disorder. So patients having uh, resistant symptoms uh, in spite of antipsychotic drugs are treated the same way as patients that have no symptoms anymore. And there is no difference, and the same treatment recommendations go for remitted and non-remitted patients at the same time. And uh, as a last point, which is also uh, mentioned by Marty, is the exclusive focus on relapse prevention, because we all want to prevent relapses, of course. That's a kind of obsession of psychiatrists about symptoms. But what we don't look at is the functioning in daily life. And actually for a patient, it's more important to function in daily life than being, uh, let's say, uh, assigned to a certain diagnosis of psychosis or something else. Or it actually, functioning matters more than relapse and symptoms, I think. So we want to focus on functioning levels. So we did this RCT and our first hypothesis was that it would lead to better quality of life and better functioning in these patients who were on lower dosages or even discontinued. But that would be probably at a cost of higher relapse rates because when you go lower the dose of antipsychotic drugs, you might have more patients that would relapse it would be kind of trade-off. More relapses as a disadvantage, but better functioning to trade-off. <coughs> this is the design of the study. And <coughs> you see uh, at the left side, there's onset of psychosis. That could be onset of psychosis 20 years ago. We had one patient who was psychotic for 20 years but never had used any antipsychotic drugs because that was the Inclusion criterion was never having used any antipsychotics because the dopamine system had to be 
not upregulated by antipsychotics. And then there would be somewhere a response to the antipsychotics that were given to the patient to, to get a remission. And when this remission was there, we included the patient into the trial. And then for six months, from T0 to T6 up there, the patient had to be stable in remission, so having no positive symptoms and no relapses. And then we would assign him to either discontinuation challenge or maintenance treatment strategy. So discontinuation challenge meant that we were intention to treat um, the psychiatrists that treat these patients would try to reduce the doses gradually and at the time that the patient would agree with them to do it and the family members of course who were involved in it uh, accepted the strategy as such because there was something to win, better functioning, but maybe a higher chance for relapses. So these patients were warned and some of these patients never really um, succeeded in discontinuation. Some of these patients were reluctant or didn't, but they were included into the, the arm. They still were in. I will show you the results in a minute. So that we did intention to treat for another 18 months and then evaluated the results. Here you see how many patients went in. There were 257 patients First episode patients who were eligible for trial, it was a large catchment area of about 3.5 million people living there. So many psychiatrists uh, sent us these first episode patients. 100 patients were not um, participating into the trial. They were completely lost to follow up. They had also in many times no contact with mental health care services. Um, they met criteria though but actually their profile was not as positive as the ones that went on to participate. So 157 patients were randomized. Eight patients didn't have this six months of remission or relapsed untimely, and one patient committed suicide. 11 patients withdrew their informed consent. They said, well, no, I, I retreat. So 128 patients went into the trial. The original trial, dividing them across maintenance treatment and discontinuation strategy. So that is half of the patients that were eligible for the trial. So when you transfer that to your own practice, if you have a general practice seeing all kinds of first episode patients, this, what I'm going to tell you, only applies to the best half, you, you should say the best half of your patients who are, have better prognostic signs, who are in contact with you, who, who you don't have to treat with assertive community treatment. So and this limits the scope of what I'm going to tell you. So what did we find after this first trial after two years? And it was a little bit of a disappointment uh, to me because it turned out that we could take of drugs, one in five patients, 21.5%. I, I don't know what you think, but it is a significant number, of course. It's very important for these 21% of patients, of course, but it's not a great number, I thought. I had hoped for a higher number. But the other uh, disappointing thing was that we found no difference in quality of life between the arms. So what we hoped for, the better quality of life, better functioning, we didn't find. Only at the vocational level, we found that 35%, again, 70% of the patients were working at least two days a week, which is a significant difference when you view at it, but it was not significant because it was too small numbers. It, it trended. But there was a, another drawback, and it was that there were twice as many relapses in the dose reduction strategy when compared to the maintenance treatment strategy. 42% of relapses against 21 in the maintenance treatment. So there's all, all the people who always argue that you should continue with antipsychotic drugs say, well, okay, that's what we always said. Then uh, you, you find the same that we always uh, promote and say 
that you should continue because you get relapses. But these relapses were very benign. They were mild, no, they had no impact on inpatient days. And the relapse threshold that we used was very, very low because, of course, we didn't want to have relapses that would pass without knowing it. So we had very low threshold uh, boundaries for defining relapse. So even when the symptoms a little bit uh, re-emerge or aggravated, we called it a relapse. And actually, you should maybe, for clinical relevance, say that you would have a higher threshold to really speak about relapse. So this looks very severe, twice as many relapses, but actually it didn't mean very much. But okay. But then, after seven years, some patients and some patients and also some uh, people that we uh, spoke to about the first trial asked us, how will these people do that, that had this original strategy? But there were five years left to the discretion of their clinicians everywhere through the country, so there was no intervention anymore. So lots of people told me then, well, you, you're not going to find any differences after seven years. Forget it. But we got money from Janssen Seilek, so we would do it. And we tried to find all these uh, patients. And the aim was to compare rates of recovery, because that's really important to the patient. It's not about the relapse thing, but it's about rates of recovery. Tricky business, like Marty said, but we tried to, to do it. And we found 103 patients, which is more than 80% of the original 128 patients, again, and prepared to co cooperate again. So it's a very high number, really. And of course, there were some people who did not participate. Uh, 18 patients refused to participate. They, they said, well, not for me anymore. Six patients we couldn't find anymore, which is a very low number. And one patient committed suicide. And we were happy that there were no differences between the patients that we found and prepared to cooperate again and the ones that refused. So there was not a special selection there. And there were also no baseline differences between the patients in the 103 follow-up sample. 52 were having originally the dose reduction strategy, 51 had the maintenance treatment strategy, and they didn't differ in any respect. So it's very important because otherwise you, sh you could say that there was a kind of difference between these two groups, but there wasn't on not any um, parameter that we recorded. So no difference in duration of entry psychosis, substance abuse, uh, diagnosis. And we defined recovery, which was our outcome criterion, as meeting criteria for both symptomatic remission and functional remission. And symptomatic remission, we use the Andreessen criteria, which are quite good. And for functional remission, we use the groaning and disability scale, which was developed under auspice of the WHO, and it measures uh, social role functioning. And seven social roles, self-care, housekeeping, peer relationships, family relationships, community integration, and vocational functioning. So to fulfill these criteria, you really have to function well. And these are the results of the follow-up trial. And when I saw this on my computer screen, in a, a little different format, I couldn't believe what I saw, because these results are too good to be true, actually. When you, you look at the left column, it's dose reduction arm. The column at the right of it is a maintenance treatment arm. And you see that the recover, recovery percentages in the upper row differ dramatically. 40.4% are recovered against 17.6% in the other arm. So when this was the consequence of using a new kind of drug, I think we all would use this drug, wouldn't we? Because you have more than twice as many chance that you will be recovered after seven years. 
And when you look at symptom remission, it's all also striking because there's no difference there. The symptoms do not differ. There, there is symptom remission in about 70% of the, of the cases in both arms. But functional remission is the part that does it. The difference is there. 46% against 19.6% functional remission in dose reduction strategy. So remember, this was the strategy that the patients did receive for 18 months, five years before this follow-up. And in between, there was no intervention at all. So it's amazing, I think. And then we looked what predicted recovery by doing a logistic regression analysis. And it will not be very surprising to you that, of course, the trial arm is one of the predicting factors, being in dose reduction, gives you a far bigger chance to recover after seven years. But besides that, also negative symptoms at baseline. Negative symptoms are a very important predictor for functioning over time. And living together with parents or with other people was also a predicting factor uh, regarding recovery. However, cinematic remission was only predicted by DUP by the duration of untreated psychosis. Duration of untreated psychosis did not predict functioning, did not predict recovery, but only symptoms, symptom severity levels. And for functional remission has the same predictors as recovery, but only social functioning comes to it as an extra independent predictor, which is actually not completely independent, of course. But. And here you see another striking graph these are the survival curves. And I told you that after this, the two-year trial, we were disappointed because we had twice as many relapses. And you can see that because the blue line is the line of the dose reduction arm. And you see these relapses go far quicker down than the green line, which is maintenance treatment. But then you see after some three years, about three years, that these lines seem to cross one another. They don't differ. I have to tell you, the, the last part seems different, but it's a statistically insignificant difference. So what ha actually happens is that dose reduction, early dose reduction, does make relapse chances larger, but in the end, they come out the same. So it seems like maintenance treatment does not set off relapse, but postpones it. It's not better in the end, but you get the relapse quicker when you lower the dose early. So in the end, there was no difference. When, and when you look at the statistics, uh, relapse rates in both arms were not significantly different. The mean number of relapses for a, a patient was 1.24, which was 1.13 in the dose reduction strategy and 1.35 in maintenance treatment which is a non-significant difference. And also I look to the number of patients with a certain number of, of relapses because maybe in one or other arm, some patients would have eight or 12 relapses, for instance. Well, this was not the case because the number of patients with a certain number of relapses did also not differ significantly. The range was one to five relapses in the dose reduction strategy, um, zero, zero to five, and zero to eight in the maintenance treatment strategy. And overall, no relapse occurred in 35% of the patients. So not all patients relapse. 35 of them just have one episode and that's it. And then what probably does the trick, and that is the medication dosage, because that was what we intervened at. And this was the last two years of this seven-year follow-up. So what you see is a difference of 1.4 milligram of haloperidol equivalents, which doesn't seem very much, but enough to actually maybe cut off functioning in these patients. And that's probably why they didn't function as well as the ones with the lower dose of 2.2 milligrams of haloperidol. So 
you, you can better take 2 milligrams of haloperidol than 3.6 milligrams of haloperidol in order to function properly. That's what we think is to be concluded. And then we also, because in the dose reduction strategy there were patients who completely stopped. And of course, completely stopping is a different thing than using lower dosages. So we also looked at when we, when we excluded the patients who completely stopped in the dose reduction strategy and only looked at the patients who use uh, medication still. Also then, there was a difference. So the strategy was not to get patients to completely stop drugs, but the strategy was effective in the whole range also in lowering the dose of patients who kept on drugs, but in a far more lower dosage. So it's a strategy that not only results in, it's not a, a yes or no phenomenon. It's just a gradual the reduction of the dosages. And here you see an overview of how many patients really discontinued medication. In the original trial, 17 patients were successfully dis discontinued. 14 in the dose reduction strategy and also three against their strategy in the maintenance treatment arm. <laughs> they stopped successfully with their medications. Then we found 13 of these patients back. We, we lost four patients who had the dose reduction strategy. Um, so 10 in the dose reduction strategy and three in the maintenance treatment strategy remained. Then restarted antipsychotics during follow-up were two patients in dose reduction who had, of course, again, symptoms and had to take a lower dose of medication again. So that left eight patients in dose reduction and three patients in maintenance treatment. Discontinued later on were three patients in each strategy and the total number of discontinued patients came to 11 in dose reduction and six in maintenance treatment. And then we looked at patients who did not completely stop but used less than one milligram of haloperidol equivalents a day, which is actually no substantial antipsychotic dose. And these were again the same number, 11 and six. So we had 34 patients, which is 33% without substantial antipsychotic medication, which were 42.3% in the dose reduction strategy and 23.5% in the maintenance treatment. So to conclude with, this is the first study to find major advantages of a dose reduction discontinuation strategy in patients with a remitted first episode psychosis. The recovery and functional remission rates were twice those of maintenance treatment patients. So a big difference. There were no differences in symptom remission rates and no apparent differences in any conceivable confounders. That's the, the advantage, of course, of an RCT compared to a naturalistic study like Marty Harrow's. Because when you don't want to believe it, you can never say that uh, because of the randomization, it must be the intervention that does the trick. There were no differences on short-term follow-up, but only at longer-term follow-up. That's also very important, I think. And there were also no differences in relapse rates or symptomatic domains, but only in the domains of functional capacity. So if you don't look at functional capacity or recovery, you will never notice a difference. When, you, when we would only have looked at relapse rates, we wouldn't have found anything. Anything important would have uh, lo be lost to our observations. So you have to, to take a longer view, not only two years, but at least three, four, or maybe even longer. And you have to look at functional recovery. I think that the lower load of antipsychotic drugs was, was uh, the cause of the advantage of the dose reduction strategy because it causes a relief of redundant dopamine blockade, not necessary to redress psychosis. And we still, I think, have to keep to the notion that you should treat positive symptoms as soon as they are there, as long as they are above a certain threshold to reduce duration of untreated psychosis, which is a bad prognostic, 
give, uh, given, but uh, and you should, according to what we found, you should stop as soon as you can, as the symptoms allow it, to use these drugs to allow cognitive and functional recovery. And of course, the psychological impact of being able to reduce or even stop drugs might also have played a role. We didn't measure it, but we had the experience that it fits perfectly with the modern patient-doctor relationship that you inform your patient about risks and what kind of risks uh, he wants to take and his family wants to take and try to uh, find out what is the best solution for this individual patient. But I think the psychological um, uh, things are not a plausible explanation for a large effect that we found. And I think, uh, of course, one trial is only one trial, and maybe if it's replicated, they won't find similar results, but then we have been thinking for some time about a different approach to the use of antipsychotics, but I'm still convinced that they will find the same results in replication. They're underway now. So maybe uh, it will go to changing the guidelines and the upper in, in white are still guidelines that are there and that would, will not change because of what we have found is using uh, antipsychotics as soon as possible when the symptoms are above a certain threshold, use low dosages, about half of the dosage with a maximal effect, like two milligrams of risperidone is then uh, a very good dose. And in the first episode patients, you have, of course, better chances to reduce the dosage. But then the new thing that is that after remission of positive symptoms, you should try to reduce dosage as the positive symptoms remain subsided. And you should do it in close cooperation with your patients and the family members. And if possible, you should go on doing that gradually, for instance, with one milligram respired on a week or so. But you can also wait a little time when, when situation asks for it or the patient is not ready for it. You can postpone it a little bit. You have to, to, to negotiate and find the right solution for each individual patient. But it's very feasible. And I, I think you should possibly discontinue antipsychotics if, if you can do it. But you should keep on monitoring these patients and make them aware that they should contact you in, in case of problems. And also when the family knows that, they can rely on it and it's a good thing. So and in case of recurrent positive symptoms, naturally, we start antipsychotics. That's what you should do, I think. And we do it. And actually, a lot of clinicians in, in the Netherlands say, well, I always did it that way, but I didn't talk about it. <laughs> this is my uh, team. Thank you very much.